Okay, so now we are actually live. So I'm going to go. In. Welcome. And then we would be. Actually, this is quite. And I have to at that point not look at that because there will be a lag. So there's a lag. Yeah. So that isn't what's being broadcast. That's what's being broadcast. Yeah, indeed. So welcome. If you are viewing us live, we'll, the show will start in about about 29 minutes, and all you're going to get for 20 minutes is us hoping the technology works. So my apologies for that. <laughs> yeah. Does that make sense? Yes. Testing the mic, testing the mic, testing the mic, testing the mic. Testing the mic, testing the mic, testing the mic. Hello, Dad. How are you doing? <laughs> yes, right. Ask your dad if the mic's working. Yeah. Hello, Father. Blink twice if you can hear me. Um, it isn't. So why is that? So why is that? Well, this is why we test. It's fine. Uh, ah, because this is right down. Is that? Yes, yes, I think that could well be it. Testing the mic, testing the mic, testing the mic. Sorry. Mic test, mic test, mic test. You can hear me, wonderful. Thanks, Dad. <laughs> I'm going to, careful what you do, we're going to suck you into all of these if you... Uh, yep. Yeah, pay you later. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Tech support. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Thanks, Dad. See, see you soon. We're going to sign off now. <laughs> turns it down for all of them. We don't want to do that. But maybe let's do it on the safe side because I would rather people weren't hearing. Are you sure? Yeah, because it's going to be. No, that seems fine. Getting oh, yeah, a little, it's not going getting to be a bit yellow, it? but feel free to keep an eye on it and tweak okay. as needed.
it's probably it's one o'clock, so turn 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 on the mic up, turn on the microphone. So good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to Live from the Archive. My name is Tom, Tom Ferber, and I'm an Engagement Learning Officer here at London Metropolitan Archives. And it's my very great pleasure this afternoon to be talking to you about this, the map that we call the, the Greenwood the Greenwood map. Um, before we get into the details about the map behind me, let me just do a little bit of housekeeping and um, give a bit of a context to the exhibition that we have as well. So the first thing I'm going to say is you should all be able to hear me, you should be able to and, and see me as well. If there are any problems, do pop that in the chat and we'll get that, we'll get that fixed. My, my lovely colleague Claire is assisting me today, so she will get those, she'll get those sorted for us. And I'd please, please, please do say, I'd much rather if there was a problem we found out about it as we're going live and then fixed it and carried on, rather than think we've done a great job, everyone's had a nice time, and it turns out that no one could see or hear anything. So please don't be shy if there are problems we'd like to get them fixed. And there will be time for questions at the end, so we'll, we'll take questions on the chat at the end of the presentation. Um, so, that being said, um, this map that we see before us, the Greenwood... Oh, there was one other piece of housekeeping I just remembered. I'm afraid we're slightly in a thoroughfare here, um, just due to, the, due to the location of the, of the map and the camera. So hopefully that won't have too much of an effect, there won't be too much of a distraction, but I'm afraid that is the, uh, the perils of working, of working in situ, so just please be aware of that. So, and where are we situated? Well, we're situated in our exhibition space. This, we run one or two exhibitions a year here at London Metropolitan Archives designed to show off our collection, show off the project work that we do and sort of bring, bring new people into the collections. Um, and this is the Magnificent Maps of London exhibition. It's been running since, uh, since April. Um, it was due to finish next month. It was due to finish in October, but it's been very popular. So we're actually extending it now till March. So if you are fairly local to London and you want to come and, come and see the exhibition, you know, have until March to do so. Um, as the name suggests, it's an exhibition that shows off some of the various maps that we have in our in our collection um, and we have them displayed both in their original format so you can see the original um, Civitas Londinium the oldest map of London and a few other original maps in their archival form and we also have maps reproduced in various sizes in in facsimile so digital copies and that's what we're looking at today so behind me is the a, a digital reproduction what we would call a facsimile of the Greenwood map so what we'll do is we'll hear a little bit about the map itself, a little bit about the people um, um, that, that made the map, and then we're going to use this as a map to see, uh, as a way in some of the interesting changes that happened to London in the first few decades of the 19th century, the 1800s. So we call it the Greenwood, the Greenwood map. So that's a, that's and that's a, a simple clue that it was reproduced. It was uh, surveyed and published by two two surveyors, uh, Christopher and John John Greenwood, and they were responding. So the London map making trade is starting to really pick off, pick up at this at this time, and they're responding to a demand for a new a new map of London, new maps of London to reflect the changes of London. I should say that what maps are. Um, we need to maybe park our modern idea of a map of something to get you get you around from A to, a to you know from A to B you know the A to Z style of mapping. At this time, people want to have maps, but they're also art objects and objects for display, and you can get the sense of that from the, from this map reproduced behind me. This isn't something that you would use to navigate your way. This is something that you might kind of display on your wall as an object of collection. So there's a big market for these kind of um, maps and these these collectible maps, but there is a desire for them to be to be accurate. So. Christopher and John Greenwood are part of this, this sort of burgeoning and ever kind of accelerating map trade. They, they're from Yorkshire initially and they open a shop in Leicester Square in 1818. And if you've been to an, any of these talks previously or if, you, if you're sort of familiar with the history of maps and, and map makers and publishing, um, what I'm about to say will not surprise you, which was um, as sort of Producers of fine objects, they did very well. As businessmen, they struggled. So it's notoriously difficult to make uh, a good living in the um, in the map trade. Um, as you can imagine, surveying, producing a map is a huge amount of work, um, and it's hard to recoup your investment, particularly when um, at this time it was quite easy to get around copyright and restrictions like that. So people would quite happily pilfer your plates and pilfer your work. So the the sellers of the maps tended to do quite well, um, the makers of the maps a lot, a lot, a lot less so. And this, I'm afraid, is a pattern that was rep um, replicated in the lives of Christopher and John Greenwood. So um, in uh, towards sort of 
they have various ambitious plans for a, um, a, a countrywide survey. They are able, outside of their London map making, to produce very fine county surveys of England. Um, by the 1840s, um, Christopher, the older brother, has spent time in jail for debt, and their stock is dispersed and sold and sold at auction. Um, really, at this point, Christopher leaves the map making business and dies um, 15 years later, in 1855. And then John sort of soldiers on in the map making world, but not as a not as a businessman. So he moves back to and moves back to Yorkshire and works as a, um, a producer of estate plans, a, a more, reliable, more reliable part of the map trade. Which is all a great loss because the map, as we can see behind us, is a very beautiful, is a very beautiful thing. So it was surveyed between um, 1820, uh, 1824 uh, and 1826 and then published in 1827. And um, the, map that we, the map that we see then reflects, um, reflects the changes that have happened in London. A lot of changes in quite a short amount of time. And as map makers, the Greenwood, the Greenwood brothers prided themselves on a combination of accurate mapping, well presented. And that is something that, that we can see in this, in this map. So it's not quite as ambitious as the previous map that we, that we looked at in this series and another important milestone map of London, the Horwood map of 1799. But nevertheless, we can see that it's pretty, pretty comprehensive, um, stretching from what we think of the Docklands today in the east and in the west, finishing at modern day um, sort of Hyde, Hyde Park, Kensington Gardens. So we would think of that today as, as central London, but in, at the time, that would be seen as really all, all of London. So what I think we all find, many of us find quite interesting about this map is how um, it was seen as a sign of the growth of London, but actually to us, London seems quite quaint and quite, quite small, so it's that different, that, that different change. And this was a very um, important period of the growth of London. It's what the, a time what, that the historian Jerry White describes as the, the beginning of the end of old London, to paraphrase him slightly. So we can start to see the, the, that Victorian behemoth of a city starting to come into, starting to come into shape. And um, if we use the 1799 Horwood map, which is also on display uh, in the exhibition, you can find it in various places on, online as well, um, as, as a starting point. As, and, a, and a convenient reference for the end of the 1700s, there's some important changes that we can, that we can track. If we use a rough period of 1800 to 1830 as, as the changes in the map, we can see these divided into um, different phases and those different phases um, with different um, people behind them. We're going to see um, government, both sort of, to use the modern language, central government, so at this time the crown, we're going to see uh, local government, so the City of London Corporation, and then we're going to see private enterprise as well. These are the forces that are going to be reshaping London in this early, in this early period. Um, so the first of the changes that we're going, to, we're, going to, we're going to see, so could we move please on to um, slide this is bridges, please Claire, which might not be the next one. I think we've skipped whole map. We'll go straight to, straight to bridges if that's okay. So uh, you should, uh, in a moment's time, be able to see a close-up view of the River Thames, and on that we're going to see some extra bridges. So before about 1800, there were three bridges in what, uh, three, three river crossings, so that would be Westminster Bridge, Blackfriars Bridge, and London Bridges, and London Bridge, excuse me. You would have been able to cross the river at, um, at Putney and, um, let's say, Wandsworth, um, wooden bridges there. Um, would, again, today, we would think of them as London, but at this time, they would have been considered outside of London. So you'd have three bridges in, in the London area. And we're going to see three additions to this, uh, uh, three additions to this in this period. So we're going to see uh, Vauxhall Bridge, which you might not be able to see on this map. I can't quite remember where I cut it, but you should definitely be able to see Waterloo Bridge uh, and Southwark Bridge as well, the, uh, new, new bridges. These were bridges that were uh, funded by, again, private enterprise, and the idea was that you'd pay a toll to, to cross these bridges. Waterloo Bridge is probably the, was at the time, the most well-known and most famous of these bridges, um, renamed a couple of years after the battle, so renamed Waterloo Bridge in 1817, and prior to that, known as the Strand, Strand Bridge. This, at its time, was considered the most beautiful bridge in London, um, but it turns out when people are choosing their bridges, they tend to go by you know, price rather than aesthetics. So it's, as you can see from the map, it's very close to um, uh, where are Waterloo Bridge, uh, to Westminster Bridge, and people didn't want to pay the toll. So you could cross Westminster Bridge for free, or you could pay halfpence for a, 
uh, a pedestrian and more for a vehicle to cross uh, Waterloo Bridge and people voted with their, with their feet and it didn't do well financially, although of course it's a fine bridge. But I should say it's not the bridge we have today. That's a later, that's a later bridge on the same site, a feature we see quite a lot actually with London, London bridges. We can also see Southwark Bridge and on this map as well we can see, interestingly, we can see for those uh, who are with me, you can see two London bridges. And you should be so between 1823 and 1830 the City of London built a new London bridge but interestingly it keeps the old one as it's, as it's being built. So on this map we have two London bridges, one marked London Bridge, please come through, one marked London Bridge and one marked, one marked New London Bridge. I'm just gonna... There we go. Um, and the city, that, that, bridge, that bridge, however, I believe was funded by, by the City of London Corporation. Could we have the slide, the scene, I should say, that says Northwest, please, Claire? Right to the start of our period, we also see changes to the, the northwest, um, the northwest entrance to, to the city, in particular at Snow Hill and around, um, uh, and around um, Fleet Street, the Monument to Tem Temple Bar. So uh, if you picture, um, let me find it on the map, there's the tower, there we go, St Paul's. If you picture coming into the London, uh, coming into London via, via Holborn, uh, today it would be the Holborn Viaduct. But that's a later addition. So what, we, that, what that tells us is this has always been a bit of a pinch point, a bit of a tricky way into the city. But um, this was previously, it's now Skinner Street. Uh, but previously it was, it was Snow Hill. And Snow Hill was known as a particularly bad way into the city. So it was crowded, it was narrow, uh, it was windy, and it was downhill. So not, not safe and not convenient. So it'd been one of those sort of no nuisances for a long time. And at this period we get a couple of... Um, so energetic aldermen, so aldermen are um, part of the city government who want to, uh, and then later Lord Mayor as well, um, Pickford, um, who want to improve this part of this part of the city. They they both manage to replace Snow Hill with with Skinner Street, um, and then after that they they go sort of further west, and they try unsuccessfully uh, to remove um, the, the Temple Bar, which was a famous blockage into the, into, the, uh, into the city. So designed by Christopher Wren, it was a sort of fine, ornate um, sort of entrance way, uh, looked lovely, uh, not practical, kind of a famous, famous bottleneck. Today there's the Monument Temple Bar on the way into the city, uh, and that's still a traffic, still a traffic pinch, pinch point to, to this day. So it's interesting to see these problems that face between different, different generations. Uh, so they, they weren't able to, um, and they weren't able to sort of fully renovate this, this, this part of London, but they were able to sort of tidy it up, get rid of some, as they saw them, old and decrepit houses and needed things up. And indeed, Pickford um, is um, memorialised and there's a street just north of St. Clement Danes Church, named after, named after the alderman that brought those changes. Next slide, please, Claire, which should be, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, should be um, Regent Street. Yes, jolly good. So these were important changes and they give, they set the tone for a city that's both growing and trying to kind of improve its infrastructure. But the really big change in this, this period in terms of, of roadways is, um, is Regent Street. So you can see, if you're with me, you can see, see Regent Street here, excuse me, Regent's Park here, all the way, all the way down, Regent Street following all the way down to St. James's Park, uh, Green Park. What we think of as Buckingham Palace on this map, just. Uh, described as the King's Palace and, and Hyde Park. So what we have, um, uh, what we have as the, 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 sort of the genesis behind this work is um, the ego, if there's no other way to put it, the kind of a very large ego of George, George IV, um, Prince Regent, and then, 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 then George IV. So a man, a man of, of great sort of extravagance and, and appetites, not all of them kind of healthy or for, those, for those around him. Um, and... We also need to put this in the context of national rivalry or between uh, um, Britain and France and a personal rivalry between George IV and Napoleon. So George wanted his city to be better than Paris. He wanted it to be fancier than Paris and he wasn't afraid to splash the, splash the cash to make it, to make it. so. Um, I, I jest, but that was an important part of the, of the motivation. And um, in these various um, improvements, to use the language of the time that were made, um, George IV's partner, well, um, sort of go-to man was John Nash, who was a sort of chosen architect and town planner. So it's John Nash that was responsible for the, the line of, um, 
of Regent Street and for many of the, the project manager and for individually designing many of the sections of it as well. And we can see it has this great sort of sweep along here. Now you read slightly different you read slightly different accounts in different places, but the, um, of quite what was intended to be in Regent's Park and quite what was intended to be um, in sort of St. James's Park, Green Park as well. But the, the gist of it is that you need to sort of slightly untangle, is it seems like George, certainly at one point at least, wanted a palace in Regent's Park and a palace at the other end, and then to have them connected by this grand sort of ceremonial boulevard. Um, again, this is a... It's designed to be national splendour, but we've got to weave a bit of ego in there as well. And then various sort of machinations, sort of political and financial, I mean the, the resulting picture was a love, well, two lovely parks, a park in Regent's Park and St. James's Park here, but then the palace itself being what was Buckingham House, along with the Duke of Buckingham, um, converted into Buckingham Palace by, by George IV. Again, quite how that worked out, what, when, what was going to happen, very slightly by, by account, but that's the, that's the gist of it, that's sort of the background, um, the background to it. Um, and interestingly, actually, George, the, um, George IV's brother is on a big statue there, Carlton, where it finishes, the big statue, there. that's Frederick, the Duke, of, the Duke of York. And he is the grand old York, Duke of, of nursery, rhyme, nursery rhyme fame. And you can, you can, you can look up the, 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 the meaning of that, uh, the origin of that nursery rhyme, but let's just say um, it's a good thing that he wasn't the one fighting Napoleon, which at one point he might have had to be. So we've, we've seen Regent's Park, so we've seen, we've seen our local authority, we've seen the city, we've seen the crown, and the... Thank you. In the few minutes remaining, could we have the docks slide scene, please? Sure. Please, Claire. Um, we're now over to, to the east, and we're going to see, again, um, private enterprise trans transforming, transforming London. So when uh, we looked at Hallward before, if you look at Hallward before, um, just towards the end of the 1700s, there's only two small sort of purpose-built docks in London. That's not to say there wasn't a huge amount of trade at the river, but it's just to say that purpose-built docks weren't there to support it. And now, only 27 years later, we can see docks stretching from the Tower, St. Catherine's Dock, the London Dock, um, the Surrey, Surrey Commercial Docks, various docks running south, and then on the Isle of Dogs, we can see the West India Docks and a proposed Collier Dock. So this tells us the West and East India Docks, excuse me. So what we can see here is how much trade is, is um, is burgeoning, accelerating in this time. So this really is the, the heyday of the kind of imperial, or the start of the heyday, I should say, of the imperial imperial trade. And what we're seeing is we're seeing kind of um, wealthy, practical, and I think it's fair to say ruthless men wanting ways to kind of maximise the, their profits and maximise the efficiency of their businesses. And the old system of having ships more in the, more in the Thames waiting to unload at customs house to have their, their cargo checked, of insecure warehouses that meant they were their, um, uh, their goods were stolen in transit was no longer efficient. So we see a movement led by um, Robert Milligan in the closing years of the 1790s and the early 1800s to build purpose-built docks, and these become the West India docks. So Robert Milligan is probably one of those features, the, one of those figures that's becoming kind of more controversial now than he, than he was then because he was a West India merchant and the controversial part, of course, to a modern sensibility, and, it, and indeed, I should say, controversial at the time too, was he was also a slave trader uh, as well. And so we can see that influence there. But, you know, regardless of the source of the wealth, just in terms of it, it's, it's interesting to see how the, um, the topography of London is changing very, very drastically in reflection of this wealth that's coming in, coming into London. And these are, these are trends that will... Um, will kind of continue and accelerate throughout the 19th century. We'll see ever new parks of London expanded in response to influx of people, kind of seeking, um, seeking money, industry, and we'll see an ever kind of uh, eastward um, trend of Docklands moving further and further east until the, until the sea. So I hope that's a, a bit of an introduction to, to, to the map itself and also give you a sense of some of the changes that are being reflected in this map. And now we're very happy to take uh, questions from people, obviously, those of you who've been kind enough to join me in person and for those of you who join us online as well, if you have questions, please do, please do type them in and I'll do my very best to, to answer them. But uh, whilst people at home are typing questions, should, should they want to, um, so has anyone any questions from those of us in the room today? Are there contours? No, no. So not con so. 
So just the people at home, the question was, are there contours on this map? So there, no, no, no contours on, on this map. It's purely um, sort of street, street plan. Thank you. Um, yeah. Is that the new thing that they almost, uh, was that an avant-garde thing to show, mm. or is this quite a common thing that has, ha has happened before to do a sort of sketch because you know the project is yeah. about to happen? But, uh, yeah, thank you. So the question was, um, there's if we go to the Docton slide, which actually we should be on now, as well as the West India docks below it, sort of in a sort of ghostly sketched in fashion, there's um, proposed collier docks. So the question was, um, is this a normal thing to have docks, to have things that don't yet exist put into maps? And the answer is yes. You do see that quite a lot throughout many of the maps, actually, that we can see. I think even maps that are uh, claiming to be, well, striving to very high standard accuracy will put in proposed projects. Um, and it goes back to this idea of the map traders uh, difficult and competitive. People want their maps to be accurate, and they don't want it to be obsolete as soon as it's as soon as it's produced. So it's, some, it's something that you do see, and it can be a useful um, um, as historians, as researchers. If you want to do that London that never was kind of train of thought, it's a really nice way of of, of doing it because sometimes they get really really caught out. And and the other thing you see relatedly, and that happened with Greenwood, is people will just they'll take an old map and they'll just slap a few features. I'm being a bit a bit flippant, but they will um, they'll take a map that's basically inaccurate. Twenty so for this for example, this one in 1851, I believe the publisher was um, was Ruff R U F F, um, reproduced the Greenwood map at the time of the Great Exhibition, put on a few extra details around the focus of the exhibition in Hyde Park but the rest of the map was basically untouched and so it's out of date. So yes, you do see those sorts of inaccuracies. So it's really tempting when you're using maps for research to, be to believe them. Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't believe them, but you do have to be quite a critical consumer because they're so pretty, like they beguile you, but you have to be on your guard. Um, are there any questions from home, Claire? From home, from remotely. Yes, um, well, a comment that even today the road atlases have shown planned roads Indeed, yes, absolutely, absolutely that. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you to the commenter. Any questions? Mm -hmm. Very good. Well, we'll give people. Yeah, yeah, well, we'll give people on the minute to write in. I think there's another question. I just want to ask, and I haven't read the, yeah. the explanation, but the, these shapes that look like fields, ancient fields. Yeah. Is that what they actually are? I believe so. Yes. Yeah. So. So the, the question um, for the people at home, the question was, are the, do these show field boundaries, the, the, these shapes here? And yes, I believe, the answer is yes, I believe, I believe so. Yeah. Of course. Um, were many copies of this printed? Yes, so the question was, were many copies printed? I couldn't give you an exact figure, but it would have been a mass-produced, uh, relatively speaking, mass-produced item. So I want to say we're probably talking hundreds, low thousands. That's the kind of figure I have. Claire, what do you think? Yeah, I'd have friends to disagree with that. Often these maps, Greenwood became a bit of a base layer yeah. it, for other maps, yeah. so it probably had a, a really long life. Yeah. Um, so, so as well as a sort of original press, yeah. it, there would have been other map makers that would have used it. And, yeah. So yeah, yeah, potentially it could be more than that. Yeah, so I'm not, I'm not sure the mic would pick that up, so just, yes. so, so no, no, it's fine. So just, just for the benefit of people watching remotely, so, um, Claire doesn't disagree with the with the nine hundred the, 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 the high hundreds of thousands, but with the important qualifier that this map would have been reproduced for other reasons. So this doesn't. There we go. The, the map would have been reproduced for other um, for other reasons. So you might see, you know, the initial press might have been the numbers we talked about, but it's a map that, that lives on. And that does actually remind me that I forgot. I meant I forget. I meant to say, but forgot. You'll have seen at home on the slides actually. The, the, some of the maps would have slightly different colouring. So the, the, the first slide is, is a map from our collection. And then I believe the second slide where we saw the bridges is a screenshot taken from an excellent website called Layers of London, where you can see this map online. Um, but that is a digitised copy of, I think it's Museum of London Archaeology's. So MOLA have it's their map, and apologies if it's, if it's not theirs. Um, but that has slightly different colouring. So these maps have been printed and hand, often hand-coloured afterwards. You could pay less for an uncoloured version, you could pay more for a coloured version. So you'll see the same, the same things come off the printer, but it's been um, customised differently afterwards. So that's something to look out for as well. Thank you. Are there any other questions in the room? Sir? Uh, 
Yeah. Surely there's an enormous amount of work in surveying that. It wasn't just the two of them. Mm. Yes, so the, que the question was um, enormous amount of work, was it just the two of them? And the answer is I'm not sure. So who, basically the question was who, who surveyed it, was it just the brothers? And I don't know, you do, I know Horwood pretty much surveyed his map by himself. So it, it, I, I can't give a definitive answer, but it's plausible to me that it, it could have been. I think that's the best way I could answer that question. And, and most of what's behind you, except the north of the river, this is all Middlesex and Queen. That's right, yeah. So north the question was, is it is it all Middlesex North River? Yes. So it does there is a key of the old come through. Yeah, do, do, no, no, not at all. Do 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 come through. Um, there is a there is a key which is the various county boundaries that can be can be inspected. So it would have the old county of Middlesex, Surrey, the City of London, and I think it has um, various and Indeed, that's right. Indeed. So if you're interested in the historic um, um, sort of regional boundaries, it's a good source. That's, thank you. Um, I have questions from home? Claire? Okay, so that sounds like that's all the questions um, from home. If, if other questions come up, please feel free to, uh, to write in or kind of use the various sort of research services that we have. We'd be um, very glad to hear from you. Um, so thank you all for, for coming along. Thank you for coming along in person. Thank you for joining us from, from home. A big thank you to Claire for... Um, helping um, put, putting me in such safe hands and managing the tech it's very much appreciated um, and I'll um, I'll just say that we're uh, sort of switching up slightly the, the, the scheduling so that will be another live from the archive event um, next Tuesday we're going to switch to the first Tuesday of the month at the slightly earlier time of half past half past 12 and that will basically be our new our new pattern running running through um, with the exception of November and January because in November we have our annual closure and um, January is just a bit too close to Christmas and I think we'll all be um, nursing our wounds and eating mince pies rather than um, rather than coming to a talk at the archive on what will be the first Tuesday of, of, the, of the year. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. So um, thank you again and we'll see you again soon and we'll, we'll end the stream now. Oh, thank you very much, Sergeant.